Good afternoon um, or good morning wherever you are around the world. Uh, welcome to the second of our Google Hangouts um, on the course Identity, Conflict and Public Space on the FutureLearn uh, platform. Um, my name is Dominic Bryan and I'm the director of the Institute of Irish Studies. Um, I'm sure if you've got to the sixth week of the um, course, you're pretty sick of seeing my face. So um, we've got some other people in to talk about some of the issues today. I have with me uh, uh, to, to my right, David Russell, who's a deputy director of the um, uh, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Uh, not only that, David also is on the board of the Community Relations Council in Northern Ireland. And I also know, because David and I met many years ago, um, David did his PhD on the Lebanon and on a comparison of agreements in Lebanon and Northern Ireland. So David comes to us with a whole lot of background in this sort of uh, area and we'll be talking like, to him later about quite a few of these issues uh, around human rights but also around uh, 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 civic identities and you've been um, uh, you've been reading much of what James Zimmerman has been doing and James is with me again um, this week and involved and James has been following some of the discussions and we'll be going through some of the conversations about identity with with James um, um, so the last two weeks, we shifted gears slightly. At the beginning of the course, we were uh, we, we we looked at the nature of identity. We looked at how people identify with groups, why those groups come into conflict, why public space is important in the nature of that conflict, and we've taken as the case study that. Um, that, that we're familiar with here, which is Northern Ireland, and saw how that plays out. And you've been looking at videos of people who get involved in parades, those people who might oppose the parades. And you've also had the former, um, the former chair of the Parades Commission, Peter Osborne, in the in the fight this final week um, on video. Um, the, these last two weeks, it's a slight shift of gear because we're looking at how you deal with societies that have that sort of conflict. And we've taken two types of approach to it. We've been interested in how identity works to bring people together. So identities can create conflict. But identities can also bring people together in a sense of civic cohesion and civic belonging. The second is, what are the sorts of things that the state can do to, 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 to deal with those sort of conflicts. And what we put as a key idea there is what are the role of human rights and human rights institutions? So what I propose to do over the next, um, the next hour is go through some of the questions and some of the material that you've put up and um, have a discussion here about some of those issues and some of the, the difficulties. And I'll try and play devil's advocate with, with some of the answers. So, um, uh, I just, by the way, I'd just like to apologise to Anna Ward, who, who put some um, put some loads of material about Irish history up, and I could feel myself getting into debate about how, how far back the conflict in Ireland went. And Anna, I would have gone on for a long time around that debate, but forgive me for leaving it after only a, only a couple of comments. You, it, was a, it was a really interesting discussion. So what I want, I want to start with is the role of nationalism and diversity, all right? Because most of the countries that we live in struggle in some way, shape or form with how cohesive they might be around national identities. Do those national identities exclude people or include people? And there are different sorts of identities. So I thought I'd start um, with, with what I thought was a great example from K Christopher K Kimberley, who's put, put, been putting some great material online. And he wanted to talk about modern France. And France is interesting because um, really after the French Revolution, they were the first country to, to decide to try and do some uh, relationship between the, 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 the civilian, the, 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 the citizen and the state and to name how it was going to work. So, so Christopher gives us this process of civic development dating from before the revolution that swept away all other identities within the area um, uh, coterminous with modern France. In 1999, the Council of the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages was regarded as a threat to the unity of the French people, 
Breton and other languages within France do not have the same status as, for example, um, uh, Welsh does. Welsh is a co-official language in the EU. In Brittany, we do not have bilingual road signs. However, this itself has led to other losses of identity. My village lies outside the area where Breton was spoken, but we have town names in Breton in our, la in, in, our in signage. The language spoken is declining. There is a fairly strong Breton identity that extends down to the Loire across the Gallo speaking areas. The language is certainly a group identity, but not a national identity. Consequently, Gallo speakers feel themselves to be Breton. Now, it's, it seems to me that's a fantastic example of a country that sort of glues itself, has glued itself together by excluding diversity to a thing. And Fr France is quite well known um, for that. On the other hand, you have countries like Canada, which take an opposite approach and almost encourage a sense of diversity within, um, within their identity. So I, I thought I might start by David asking you, how important do you think that civic identities are in, in bringing countries together? What, what role does it play? And what are the, what are the problems with, with civic identities? Are, are, they, are they too weak, for example? Um, well, there's, there's a problem slightly with the question in that civic nationalisms, there's varieties of them. So yes. you've already okay. said French republicanism based on assimilationist identity. Mm. is completely different from Canadian federalism based mm. much more on integrationist than linguistic diversity and recognition of First Nations. So the whole concept of civic nationalism itself is extremely broad from the assimilationist mm. model to an integrationist model. Um, but what's pretty clear is for the state as, as an entity to exist and exist um, in a stable form, there has to be some binding force for all of the citizens. And at a basic basic level, um, civic nationalism has to be grounded in some sense of citizenship. So what we're going to come to later, the, the mm. things like rights and what it means mm. to be a citizen, who can access those rights, how they're exercised. <clears throat> and then the interesting point is um, the, two th the two types of nationalism, ethnic and civic, are often put up as if they're counterposed to one another, but that isn't necessarily always the case. And cl closer to here, I can think of Scottish ident national identity yep. as an, uh, an example in point. So there are lots of ethnic markers um, around what it is to be Scottish have over the years evolved to the extent that Scottish civic national identity, an inclusive one which will allow for people who have immigrated from all over the globe to, to buy into that identity is now an accepted discourse in mm -hmm. Scottish society. Um, so is, is nationalism would be more of the question I would ask. Is nationalism important in terms of binding people together? Undoubtedly it is because nationalism will attach to citizenship. Mm. But the line between what constitutes an ethnic nationalism, an exclusive ethnic nationalism, mm. and the more inclusive elements of civic identity mm. and how those two things interplay are, in my view, entirely context dependent. Yeah, if, if we were to counter what we're going to come to next uh, or, or around legal structures, institutions that give you a sense of citizenship, the role that rights can play, constitutions and all of those sort of things. Whilst, whilst most of us will consider themselves that that to be a very important thing in defining citizenship, there's no doubt that, that, that they don't quite capture a sense of belonging in the emotional ways that a nationalism does to, to just, yeah. so so they don't so so at some level although many of us would have liked some sort of rational world where everybody just sees themselves as a rational citizen working for these things the the reality out there is that is that you need some sort of social glue as as Anderson say some sort of imagined community yeah you took the words out of mind say imagined community or the Agnatiev you know the the blood and belonging concept mm. of of flags and shared history, shared cultural identity markers, a shared language. There has to be a common mm. sort of lingua franca for any state to effectively function. Even in the Canadian example, yes, French might have recognition in English, but there has to be a, a common language through which parliamentary forums and the public sphere can operate. 
Yeah. So there has to be things on a practical level beyond citizenship that bind the citizens of a single entity together in the sense of we have a commonality. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, it will be strengthened um, in terms of shared histories and mm. all of the things that we take as, as cultural identity markers. The further down that road a society goes, the closer it gets to the ethnic nation state example, probably best personified in Israel. Yes. So where yeah. a strong religious identity, a shared history going back into the mists mm -hmm. of time binds the concept of citizenship. Yes. The civic sense of citizenship to a very strong ethnic identity. Yeah, yeah. it's it's Tara Breslin uh, um, has a has a comment around the Canadian version of it, and she says, "I am Canadian by birth, and while I've spent as many years in the United States as a as a child and an adult as I have in Canada, moved back and forth for various various reasons." that was American, though I often identify as North American. I think Canada defining itself as a mosaic rather than a melting point has made it easier for different ethnicities and religions to develop a specific sense of identity. However, and this, this, is, this is something that my, my family also goes back and forth to, to Canada, and you'll see I put up some pictures on the Canadian uh, on Canada that day on on one of the um, one of the sections of the course, and she says here. Having said that, however, I would be hard pressed to write many lines about what does it mean to be Canadian, and that's one of the interesting things about that Canadian civic sort of identity and the ribbing that I get I give to some of my um, Canadian relatives, is that it, which is a country that I'm, I I love dearly. But nevertheless, actually defining it when it's that civic becomes quite a quite a problem, um, and and that balance between the different sorts of identities and how they're being used, I think, is important. James, being American, is that a civic identity? Do you feel? I mean, there are elements of it that I suppose could be, and that could be inclusive of anyone. Um, I mean. Thanks. Thanksgiving has a lot of bad historical connotations, but um, sitting around eating food, um, pumpkin pie, apple mm. pie, um, Fourth of July, and fireworks, and I, I suppose there are there are celebrations where people can sit down. It really doesn't matter mm -hmm. what where you're from, whatever. It's just a fun event. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of conflicting ideas about what it means to be American and America's history mm -hmm. um, that I think also complicate. How people might um, identify as American or engage in that identity. Um, we have conflicting ideas of, on the one hand, we have we're an immigrant country and we were built by immigrants, mm -hmm. and so we should be welcoming. And you know, the statue at the base of, or the plaque at the base of the Statue of Liberty says, um, "Send your huddled masses, your poor, and people who want to breathe free." Um, and then you also have ideas where America was founded as a Christian nation, and there's these very specific ideas of what it is, and so. These are all a little bit different, and one of one of the intri intriguing and with your background in Texas, you will know this. What one of the intriguing developments in in American identity seems to be the use of the Spanish language, because the, there must be a matter of time before we get to uh, a U.S. president, uh, ca presidential candidate, or indeed president makes a speech in Spanish, and will do so. For very good reasons, because a lot, not a lot of the people that voted for for him or her would have been Spanish, and I, I think that would be quite a profound moment in U.S. history. Yeah. Um, because it will, it you know, whilst you've only got as the Canadians of the North know, whilst you've only got one language, you know, it's a, it's um, uh, defining that identity is quite simple. When you get two languages, um, there's a whole lot of questions come up about how you do it. Um, um, Cynthia writes a question, she asks, um, how can the state or civil society agents promote civic identification in divided societies if one group is still discriminated against, or if the connotations of this common civic identity is just different? Are there any examples? Now, David is on the board of the Community Relations Council in Northern Ireland, and I've worked with the Community Relations Council for many many years david how would you approach how would you approach that 
question. Should the state, does the state, is it? Well, this isn't a cop out of the question, but it, again, it is very context dependent. But in, in the first half of this question about how can you, how could the institutions of the state and those responsible promote a civic identity if one group is discriminated against? The clear answer is, that's going to be extremely it's difficult, difficult yeah. because I can I can <laughs> state promote the sense of yeah. inclusiveness for people yes. to buy into if the message the state is sending out is that actually you're second class or perhaps third class citizens so that's an impossible task I, I would say and it would, would, it, would you agree with me it'd be fair to say in Northern Ireland in terms of peace building that one of the key elements to us being able to do that was dealing with the discrimination issue from the 1970s onward. Do you think that's a reasonable? Yes, I think it is. Uh, but there is an, an element to that still to be addressed, which is the concept of there, there's practical discriminations that can be tested in, in, in law clearly. And then there's a sense of unequalness that might not amount in the legal terms to discrimination, particularly around these questions of where you have more than one ethnic group where perhaps a state is, take the Breton example, where you have a French Republican model of assimilation upon which the state is found. It says everyone's welcome, but you still have this sense of, of discrimination from a particular linguistic group. Those are extremely difficult things to deal with. Mm. Um, requires a lot of constitutional change, a lot of negotiated political settlement um, over time. That is effectively what we have done here as well. It's beyond just what was done in terms of the clear discriminations around housing and social mm -hmm. um, policy, but but all the other aspects of it, of a sense of ownership of government, a sense of equal recognition of identity, that is where Canada, despite yes. the fact that its civic identity yes. might be getting questioned here, yes, the non-discriminatory elements of its constitution, increasingly um, inclusive, and then recognition of it politically, whether through Charlottetown Accord mm. or whatever, mm. um, has been effective. The and interesting question earlier was, to what extent does that process mm. wash out the sense of cohesiveness that civic identity actually yes. requires? Yes. Um, yeah. It's a... Well, that's one of the problems with the US, I think, is we have a history of genocide against Native Americans, slavery and segregation era, um, and gender discrimination, sexuality discrimination, and how do these groups, how do they engage in this? How are they, how are they a part of this group or this identity um, that's supposed to be shared in civic if they are second class citizens, if they don't have the same rights, mm. um, both in a legal sense and just in terms of uh, systemic mm. um, perceptions that cause people to treat you differently. And my, my sense, Going back to the Canadian example, my sense is that if you are going to create a sense of belonging in those situations, but you have clear minority groups in, 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 in Canada, of course, as, as, as well as the split between French and English speaking, there's the First Nation issues, despite on top of all the other diversities that they have. Um, however, I do think, I've always thought that one of the ways that they've shown themselves to be successful is by going so far on, for instance, giving language rights. Now, it does drive quite a lot of English being Canadian a bit nuts that they can be miles and miles away from Quebec and still have to learn French to get in government and the, can't, the thing. But it seems to me that if you're going to make a cohesive society, you have to go that bit further with making sure that that minority feels protected. The difficulty always is, I mean, and, and I think Northern Ireland is a good example, is that it, it's, it's not a, it's, it feels often like a zero-sum game. So here, many in unionism and loyalism would consider, their, consider them to be diminished in some way as, as Catholics or nationalists have increasing rights. Well, it also depends who, if the purpose of, the, of those who support the civic entity of the state are driving policy, then the job to some extent has to be to be inclusive and provide of all of those things that you have suggested. The difficulty in Canada and also to hear probably to a much greater extent is those elements of particular ethnic identities who are fundamentally questioning whether the state should exist or not. Mm. Um, that's an entirely different discussion to take place. So if it's Quebecois separatists yeah. who are holding to a particular worldview of we don't want to be part of a Canadian civic identity, then 
the debate can become much more of a zero-sum game because one interest group is only about how much can we get on the road mm. to an outcome that we foresee as possible mm. in the future. Mm. Think of even the, the recently, again, just across from us in terms of the SNP-led debate around Scottish independence. Um, and here a year on mm. from a, a no vote, albeit marginal one, we're back almost immediately to the same discussion that, that they were having in Scotland prior to, to the vote. Mm. So that will continue. That, 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 that sort of debate will no doubt continue regardless. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 there's, a, there's a good debate going on in, um, and if we've got two pictures there, I think, uh, uh, some pictures coming up of the, um, uh, from, from Corsica of demonstrations. There's also, if people go online, there's some fantastic um, pictures and videos from the Catalan um, area, either the Catalan country or the Catalan area of Spain, where this politics has been very vibrant in the in the last few um, uh, in the last few well uh, for years, but the last few few months. I think there's a couple of pictures there if we scroll on down. And the ability of the state, and this is what we're sort of coming to. The ability, the ability of the state to manage public spaces in these particular cases is really interesting, and that's what we've struggled with here, and what so many of these, uh, so many of these issues, um, so many of these issues are about. Um, I, I, I want to go on to an example of shared identities that created a whole lot of discussions um, uh, on the um, uh, uh, on the course. Uh, which um, James was part of, and that was trying to find different types of um, uh, trying to find different types of identity that bring people together. And and one of the one of the examples that we put up um, was that of Pride events. Um, <coughs> And Tara Breslin, so let's let's go to the two sides of this debate. Tara Breslin says, I'm hard pressed to think of another event which would be as inclusive as a pride event, as this is a sexual identification issue which doesn't have color, gender, or socioeconomic boundaries. There are no links to contested land use, colonialism, religious schism, legal, legal segregation. The rainbow banner, banner is not affiliated with any state structure. It does not even mean the person holding it or wearing a pride t-shirt is a member of the LGBT community. All right. On the other hand, we had some arguments. James Welsh um, and John Wilde put some material up. James Welsh said, the so-called pride events are attempts, attempts to be inclusive and attempts to project an impression of generalized public acceptance. However, I feel this is by no means the case. In this particular example, for instance, the images that are portrayed are of no interest to myself and perhaps others who may well not wish to be subjected to what are frequently events for students with vulgar and demeaning um, displays of public um, eroticism. Um, and John Wilde said, um, James, I have some sympathy with your views. I was in Manchester a few years ago and there was a parade of LGBTs and some slogans, both printed and verbal, with pretty crude, and I'm sure some people would have found, found them offensive. So if I bring this together, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to James about it here. James Welsh ended, could someone please explain to me then, just how do public displays of nudity and vulgarity become acceptable expressions of political malcontent? Um, when any other individuals would be arrested for public lewdness, indecent exposure, or offending public sensibilities. In other words, what separates a flasher from a vulgar pride marcher? So, James, pride events, are they exclusive or inclusive? Well, looking at both Tara, John, and James, um, so Tara says it's inclusive because <laughs> it's about sexual identification. It doesn't have color, gender, socioeconomic boundaries. There's no colonialism, et cetera, to the history. And also straight people can attend LGBT pride. Um, which of course, we were talking the other day, um, the Houston Pride Parade this year had over 700,000 people there. I would imagine the vast majority of them were probably straight. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, these are people who are coming out um, 
they're pro LGBT rights. They want LGBT people to have the same rights as everyone else in society. Um, so it's inclusive in that sense. Um, I will say it, it does get criticized pride and LGBT organizations for representing white middle-class gay men, um, mm -hmm. more than other groups. So I would say it does have, um, ethnic gender and socioeconomic issues within the LGBT community where an LGBT, LGBT woman of color might not feel completely mm -hmm. included in LGBT representations. Um, but then as to like the public eroticism and stuff, I'm sure it happens. I've seen people in the parade itself in speedos and stuff, um, which is weird outside of a beach, admittedly. Yeah. Um, but nothing that you wouldn't see. I mean, you see the same thing at a music festival. Yeah, you see the yeah. same thing at Pride. I mean, not Pride, Mardi Gras. You see the same thing at any large gather to have fun. And mm -hmm. it's not like the Macy's Day event where yeah. it's meant to be a family fun day. Yeah. Um, and this is for adults. Yeah. Um, and I've I've never seen anything sexual going on. Again, I'm sure it happens, but it, with over 700,000 people, it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and it is still a public street, and I imagine many of them do get in trouble for it. And then some of the, I know like San Francisco and Seattle pride parades are ones where you do get pictures of a handful of uh, actually naked people. That's not really representative of pride or what pride is because Seattle and San Francisco both have a different relationship to um, public nudity. And there are several marathons and bike rides in both those cities every year where hundreds of people show up naked. Yeah. So um, if, we, if, we, if we look, I mean, the example that you mentioned, if we go back to our photographs, um, and, and we're going to have to go down a couple, um, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a number of pictures, um, if we go down, but that's the Pride Parade in Belfast. But the one I'm interested in is the next one, which is Mardi Gras, um, because the, the displays, overt displays of sexuality and lewdness, for those of you that don't know, um, uh, the beads are got in part, and this has a complicated history, I believe, and, and hasn't always been part of Mardi Gras, but the, 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 the beads are got in chiefly by women who bear their breasts in public and then are thrown beads down. I don't know, have you ever done been to Mardi Gras? Uh, it, that's, Mardi Gras is often about flashing for beads, and yes. not the exclusive way to get yeah. divorced, but Yeah, and, and I suspect, by the way, there's plenty of people, in fact, I know there are people in Mardi Gras who don't like that sure. element of Absolutely. it. You know, I mean, you've got to be aware that in these sort of large public events, there are mixed, and I, I did a bits of work with the Notting Hill Carnival, and the tensions internally about what is and isn't acceptable are almost as great as the one externally. Yeah, well, when you have tens or hundreds of thousands of people at an event like this, it takes thousands of volunteers to put it together. Both people attending and people putting it on are gonna have conflicting views about yeah. um, what's going on. Yeah, the, there is, I mean, I think it was, um, um, James made a point about, sh about showing respect, and I think he put up some pictures. If we go to the next picture, um, James put up some interesting stuff. I think it was from, um, um, I'm not sure if it was Saudi Arabia, I'm trying to remember. I think it was the UAE. I think it was the UAE. <clears throat> Interesting picture about, about people showing respect. Um, much of this, much of this is about, the discussion we're having about, isn't about, I think, you know, in public spaces, people will do things that offend. Yeah. Um, I mean, that seems to me, all, all, all sorts of, all, in all sorts of ways. Now, whether that makes them exclusive or not, I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult one. I, you know, I can see, I can see, um, I can see how people can look at an event like that. I went down to the Pride event in Belfast um, a couple of years ago, and I decided, as a little social experiment, to stand with the protesters. Um, and they were very religious protesters and just watch and feel what's going on. And one of the things that I, I felt, which, which added to my understanding, I felt my understanding and listening to them talk was their fear of it. Sure. And I think, I think it's at least, it's, we at least got to think about why some expressions make different sorts of people fearful. Right. It, it seemed to me to, it seemed to me to, 
to so attack their, what would I call it, their moral universe, all right, that they felt, even though I'd have to accept, and other people said this to me, well, they didn't have to come down. <laughs> However, they thought it was such an attack upon their moral universe that there was a sense of fear about it. Sure. But my questions are about whether pride is any different than any public event sure. for adults, and which, in my experience, going to many prides, Mardi Gras, and other music festivals, whatever public event for adults, it's not any different. It's not any more sexualized. And I think that is often based off of perceptions about LGBT people and this idea that sexuality is sex when those aren't connected, which is what I think that's what comes out in many people's ideas of pride parade. And in my experience, it's just not the same. Mm. I mean, that's not how it is. Um, so my question was really is, does society just treat it as different? Does it have different ideas about what's normal mm. and what's acceptable for different groups of people, um, whether for LGBT people or also for women with, um, is it Free the Nipples campaign? Yeah. Um, which, why is it unacceptable for women to go shirtless in public? When men can, yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah. the exact same anatomical yeah. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but so for women to be topless, it's considered lewd, <coughs> and so those are different perceptions about what's acceptable, even thing. Um, so, David, what 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 what's the relationship between what becomes acceptable and unacceptable in society, and what people's rights are, and where does the rule of law come in? And if you're deciding, if you're comparing different societies. Um, uh, and you're looking at how human rights work. How do human rights work with all of those different sort of norms and values that exist in society? There's a bit of a tension there. These universalist, universalistic rights that we might apply against the sorts of norms and values. Well, so the, the rights are, univ are universal. Um, take freedom of expression in terms of this or freedom of association. But there is, uh, they're not absolute, those two rights. Mm -hmm. And they, they can be limited by, by the state. And one of the grounds for limitation is um, a defense of morality. And most of the treaties recognize that. The interesting thing about it is, how does the test then, how is it applied? Um, it has to be, if you're going to limit the right, it has to be a reasonable decision. It has to be a proportionate subject to a le legitimate aim necessary in a democratic society. Um, so there can be limitations. And within that, there are, certainly in Europe, at least, the European court, for example, exercises a pretty wide margin of appreciation for the states to set the tone. So what might be acceptable in the public arena in terms of nudity in one state could be entirely different from another. And both of them could, at the same time, be compatible with exactly. human rights laws. Okay. The issue, which interestingly, I see James here has asked at the beginning about, um, can someone explain how do public displays of nudity and vulgarity become acceptable in one context and not in, in another? Um, the answer to that is, if someone else was to conduct a fashion in a similar sort of situation, mm. a, a parade, for example, other than pride, since that we were talking about, and to behave in a similar fashion, would they be subject to some sort of sanction? If they would, then we're in the serious human rights territory, because in essence, the principle of equality before the law isn't being upheld. However, um, if it was a different context outside of a parade, where someone's just walking down the right. street and decides to behave in that fashion, right. which isn't a regulated context set down by the state, Again, the behavior of the state in response could be entirely different from someone <clears throat> behaving in a similar way within right. the context of the state, um, that, that within the context that the state has regulated. So it's very, very situation specific. Yeah. But the principle of equality before the law runs to the heart, really, of the question mm. that's being asked here. Um, so two different I, parades need to be treated equally. They need to be treated but equally. The well, same, the same activity framework. in a parade that's conducted somewhere else. In could be problematic. Country. It could be. In a different country. It could yeah. be. So, for example, uh, mm. uh, the expression of nudity in the UAE um, within the confines of its own domestic law will be entirely different as to what that would constitute in the UK or the Canada or, or, or elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and that is legitimate as, re as long as the state's response is proportionate. 
you know, if, if, it, if it's extreme in terms of what can and cannot happen in the public sphere, then the likelihood is the adjudicators in terms of human rights laws and standards are going to start asking serious questions about is this a proportionate response? Which to go back to the issue of the way society treats different <clears throat> groups different. Um, but yeah, this, this uh, UAE was used as an example for places where, well, yes, even straight people have to wear respectable clothing and can't kiss in public. But then on the other hand, being gay is criminalized in the UAE and punishable by death. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it's not the same as a Western context where straight people and gay people are having the same yeah. treatment. Because once again, you have an escalation where gay people are having more severe sanctions placed on yes. them. Yeah. The other interesting thing I noticed about the previous question about not, I can't think of an example that would be more inclusive than pride of an event. That was quite an interesting question because there's a difference on the concept of an inclusive event and an inclusive identity, which is where we started off yes. from. Yeah. Um, I can think of lots of events that are inclusive, to be quite honest, mm. uh, as inclusive as, as, as pride would, would mm, arguably be. More, and, yeah. and I can equally think of lots of identities that are less inclusive than, than LGBT because of the economic and social backgrounds. And think of trade union events, for example, in terms mm -hmm. of raising and protests, anyone could attend from all yes. of the varieties of backgrounds and identity markers. There's been a conflation in that question, in my view, between the concept of an inclusive identity and an inclusive event. Mm. And a lot of them, for example, the example you had used about the protesters is about ontology, worldviews. I cannot be inclusive because that doesn't match my worldview. Mm. That's completely different in many ways from identity markers and events. Mm. That's the other side of the coin. That's someone who has a strong identity marker of their own, feeling that they cannot join that yeah. particular practice. Which is different than a group excluding someone. Yes. Yeah. It, it, so let's let's take that role of human rights and the, the way that those rights might be used as a way of dealing with conflict, particularly in the public sphere. Um, and and many of you will have watched what I thought were really good discussions from the um, the famous or the infamous Skokie case outside Chicago, where some American national socialists. Um, were originally banned by the by the I think it was the area council Chicago they were banned from first and then Skokie and then the American Civil Liberties Union defended uh, their right to hold the demonstration and from the discussions that came after that people found that a very interesting um, interesting case study and there's a little a little side part of it as you'll have you gathered the lawyer who defended the the neo-nazis was himself Jewish which made the made it all the more interesting. Uh, Christopher Kimberley says, limitations on expression or assembly are extremely difficult. For instance, it is only since 2013 that we have been able to insult the president of France. <laughs> I find that <laughs> quite interesting. This was the result of a judgment by the European Court of Human Rights, a guy named uh, Hebe Eon, had held up a sign for Sarkozy in 2008 and was fined 30 euros. I think this emphasizes the importance of external organizations in determining the extent of limitations. Uh, limitations uh, really have to be proportionate consequently, and this is a bit about what you were saying, David. Um, uh, what is deemed proportionate will change, perhaps extremely quickly, during the course of an event. Some events that are likely to be with the purpose of provoking hatred and hate crime should not be allowed to take place. However, it is disproportionate application of legislation, such as blanket bans on assembly or expression, that then uh, is the infringement of rights. What Taking an overview of, of, of how either courts or human rights bodies deal with this issue. It, it, it strikes me, David, that, that it can be different in different countries. The, the, the US seems to have a different approach to this to, I'm gonna be very general here, Europe, for example. What, why is that? What, what's the, why are the differences around that approach to freedom of speech or freedom of assembly? If, it's, if, if it should be universal. No, there are there are universal norms in human rights laws. They, they're driven from the UN treaty base. 
So freedom of expression has to meet the minimum requirement and freedom of association set down by the UN. That's pr provided you're operating within that framework, which most of the world is. Yeah. Um, and the domestic laws, for example, US constitution, has to reflect as a core minimum the obligations that are contained and how that's understood within the context of the UN treaty body. So freedom of expression in particular is protected in a number of treaties, but it particularly in the covenant and civil and political rights. Um, and the US constitution has to be compatible with that piece of international law, which the US has freely and voluntarily ratified. Now within that, as long as you're meeting the core minimum, there's flexibility for a state to operate its discretion mm. as it sees fit in any, and that's why as a consequence throughout the world, you will see freedom of expression being limited to a greater or lesser extent on certain subject areas. Now, the question is, um, and I can't think of an example offhand, but uh, well, I can, let's take uh, the German example, for example, of um, Holocaust denial. Yes. yes. There's a perfect yeah. example yeah. of it. We don't have a law in the UK around Holocaust denial because the UK takes a view of freedom of expression trumps this particular issue and people should be free to express that view in the public arena, knowing that it's liable to be knocked down by other people equally expressing their freedom of expression. Um, Germany, given its history, have taken a completely different view and that is equally allowed for by the court, given the history and the sense of morals within that society. And, and that it's and, and they created legislation for it. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a legal process. They have a legal yes. Basis to say that that <clears throat> constitutes a criminal offence. Mm. This situation here, this example with regards to Sarkozy, is an eminently sensible decision by the European Court, because the idea that a citizen of France cannot stand up and criticise, however offensive the president who voluntarily has put themselves in the public sphere yes. finds it. <laughs> offend the president that he may not, for example, be fit for purpose to do the job. I uh, know it strikes me as an eminently sensible decision from the European court to say, I'm sorry, France, but you have stepped way beyond the boundaries of the discretion of an independent state in upholding basic human rights. So if you're looking at those boundaries, John Wilde had a question exactly around that. Those wanting to march under the swastika are representative of an ideology that was responsibly, responsible for the murder of millions which of course almost everybody accepts. Do people support acts of genocide have the right to use public space to proclaim their message? Surely not. But the, the, it, that, the limits of that freedom of speech is, is a really, really tough one. It would seem to me that it would depend what is meant by support for gen. If it's threatening to a group, th does that make a difference? If it's threatening to the group or to threatening to people, it has to be incitement. Yeah, it has to be incitement. So my get, 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 getting up and expressing that 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 that, um, that that the Germans did say the right thing at the right time, however awful my comments might be, wouldn't necessarily. Um, do you, know, you know, freedom of speech might allow me to do that, but you have to. Ins there has to be incitement there. Yeah, you can deny whatever you like. I can deny that I think the world was made in, you know, six days. Yeah, it's entirely within my gift to have that worldview. I can express it as publicly as I like, and as as much as that may or may not offend people, it's within my gift. Equally, people can in the public sphere say I deny that an event however abhorrent someone might find it took place. There's a, this clear distinction between doing that and saying, not only do I deny that event happened in history, but wouldn't be a good idea and did it again yeah. tomorrow. Yes. Um, so the idea that attaching to a symbol or an emblem, um, that particular worldview that we should continue to do that is, is difficult. It can be done, um, and certain certain things can I mean, be we, prescribed we, by the state. Yeah. So for and that's really where it comes down to the state. So take the swastika example. Um, some states in Europe, exactly the same way about around Holocaust denial, have symbols and emblems like the swastika banned and outlawed because mm. of the the nature of by which the state has determined individuals are likely to behave who associate with that particular symbol. And again, that's within the gift of the state. Um, but it's it's absolutely not clear cut and mm. it has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis for the same reason as take for example terrorism law 
you'll have a list of prescribed organizations that has to be subject to some sort of parliamentary or judicial scrutiny before we get to the position that this group should be banned. Mm. It, the, I mean, I think uh, where I find it extremely difficult, I mean, we, the last time we were on this Google Hangout, I, I mentioned this program I watched about the Ku Klux Klan, and it is, given the history of the Ku Klux Klan and its violence, when you see what's allowed in America with cross burnings and things like that, still under freedom of speech, I find that really quite a, um, uh, a difficult thing. And I think many people in Europe, I mean, there are very good reasons for America going to the limits it does. And in some senses, I quite admire from the way I do it. But it's a, it, sometimes you really get to those points where you think, wow, uh, you know, I find that quite, quite difficult. Well, I wanted to... I think, but what's useful to say with regards to all these examples is, if you, if you like, if the UN as the, the top of the pinnacle in terms of how do rights work, has set out a very useful general comment on this. It's general comment 34 of the Human Rights Committee. And it's absolutely clear as to where the limits of freedom of expression should be set, particularly around the, the Covenant on Civil, Civil and Political Rights. It's Article 22 talks about the state being obliged to take measures that will prevent the advocacy of racial hatred mm. and so on and so forth. That is the limitation of freedom of expression on these exact cases that we're, that mm. we're dealing with. Mm. Um, an interesting counterpoint to it, which the general comment then talks about, is take, for instance, blasphemy law. Blasphemy law, the UN has come to the conclusion, is incompatible with freedom of expression anywhere that it exists in the world, except for in circumstances where the reason for the blasphemy law is to give effect to Article 22 the advocacy of hatred of a religious group. Right. So it's warranted to have a blasphemy law if it's directed toward its incitement to religious hatred for a group. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, there blasphemy law is incompatible with human rights. Not law. if it's used to stop Monty Python's Life of Brian or yeah. something. Yeah. 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 Not if it's not if it's used to stop uh, a variety of things, <laughs> 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 yeah. including including where it links in particularly with defamation yeah. law. I think of a recent case here where Sky was reluctant to um, uh, show the Going Clear program around Scientology because yeah. of the engagement of defamation law. And, you know, that goes back to a long history of blasphemy yeah. law in, in Northern Ireland. Yeah. England and Wales, interestingly, not very long ago, removed the law of blasphemy for this reason. Mm. And here it remains. So yeah. the law in Northern Ireland at the minute is incompatible with, with international human rights standards. Interesting. Can I just, while we're on that human rights thing, because we're three quarters of the way through the, through, through the hangout, um, if you were to give a general um, sort of summing up of why human rights are important in conflict transformation, we've talked about their role in dealing with some of this public stuff and how difficult it is, but how important, how important it is. And people you will realize that, that we, we've discussed this a lot in Northern Ireland because, because around parades issue, the rights of orange men, you, you've seen all the stuff that we've, we've put up or to go through certain areas. When do people feel threatened? And we, we deal with that so we, we, um, uh, on, a, on a literally annual basis. So we've had many discussions about how our legislation works. But very broadly, what is the role that human rights legislation and institutions have in conflict dealing with the divided society. And if I was to be really, really tough, I'd say, you know, actually they don't solve many problems, that you need good community relations, but that human rights, well, where do you think human rights sits as a mechanism for dealing with divided societies? Okay, uh, let me give you an example. I'll give you a practical example as to the value of human rights, which has nothing to do with divided societies, which I think will then illustrate okay. the, the, the issue. Um, if you think of healthcare and the health system and where human rights violations are likely to occur in, in any country in the world, your rights or my rights as a patient in the healthcare system are, will most likely occur as a consequence of the decision or otherwise of a doctor or a nurse, not as a, the decision of a lawyer. However, if the healthcare system that we are patients in has a good legal basis to how those doctors and nurses will behave, then it's more likely that as a consequence of that, the doctors and nurses will make decisions that won't violate your rights or my rights as a result. Mm -hmm. 
in any given context, including in divided societies, that's precisely how human rights work. That's the value of them. The value of human rights in dealing with division isn't to give the solution. Yes, it's right. simply to give the okay. framework within which ordinary people who have to make everyday right. decisions can make better decisions as a consequence. Mm. And more importantly, they're all using the same, ideally, using exactly the same framework. Yeah. So it sets the boundaries for the discussion and it assists as a consequence where the proper decisions in mm. order to reach consensus might lie. So that's their single so value. If we're to take the divisions you get over people's right to parade and express those sorts of identities, um, it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem as such. You can't go to your your list of, your European convention and say this will tell me who has the right to parade down a road and who doesn't. What it does is it sets the boundaries, um, and it does so. And in doing so, correct me if I'm wrong. It, 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 it makes the state, the state has a, a duty to act within those boundaries to try and solve the problem. Is it? it does, and, but, but also equally important, in the very first line of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, rights aren't and duties don't just accord to the state. It also talks about the responsibilities of rights holders. So there's the duty of the state to have its decision-making framework and to operate within that, because ultimately it is the rule of law. Mm -hmm. There is also the responsibility of those people who want to exercise their rights to equally be cognizant of mm -hmm. that framework and to have respect for, let's say, protesters in the context of a parade and to behave accordingly themselves. Mm. So the onus does not just fall upon the state. It, so to take that forward, if I was to take example that we've looked at a lot, and people have put up some great examples of, of protests and, and parades, it's a picture um, which fascinated me. I was wondering how one polices some of this of, of a, a, a protest in Venice um, uh, about big ships that are coming into Venice. I, um, I, if I understand. Um, if I understand it, uh, if I understand it rightly, um, the city, I, I'll read. I'll read what it what, what it says. The city of Venice, since 2013, has had a committee of citizens and protests against big ships because they pass in the heart of the city and destroy the ecosystem of the lagoon. Last year, big demonstration of the committee. It was during the carnival, so we decided that to have a carnival boat parade. It's universally known as in Venice is built on the water. So sometimes the demonstrations are on the water. The route of the parade was along the canal, including the Grand Canal. There was a row of boats. Um, it made me um, it made me wonder um, how you police something like that. And I was looking at that and thinking, what a difference it would make in Northern Ireland if, if we were doing all our policing on 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 places like that. But, but, but what it, what I'm coming to is is how do how would you expect a policing institution? We've got lots of pictures and loads of examples picking up of the police policing. If I'm a police officer and I've got to make a decision about people's right to assembly or my use of force, how do I enact? How should I be working through human rights in that sort of thing? What do you expect of a police force around that sort of thing? What's its, where does its duties lie? Well, Let's take one step back. There should have been a framework in place by the state right. to address these issues before beforehand. There, there's a preventative obligation in almost all of the human rights that they'll be engaged. So there should be processes put in place in advance and policies and procedures and laws around that. Um, but if we get to the stage where we're actually talking about a, a parade or a protest is ongoing, whether it's on a boat in, mm -hmm. in Venice or, or elsewhere, the primary duty of, of the police is to uphold the rule of law and the rule of law includes their obligation to ensure that everything that's taken place, including the actions that they may do, take to intervene, is compliant with human rights standards, whatever mm. they may be, domestic or whether they've been ratified by, by international treaties. Um, it's entirely context dependent. You know, I don't know whether in that scenario there was an immediate threat to mm -hmm. the risk of, of, mm -hmm. of life, whether boats going down a Venice Canal and big boats coming up a Venice Canal yeah. might result in a boat I, being so no. Um <laughs> You know, it's a, extremely fluid, extremely... We should do a trip over to Venice yeah. to go and watch it, I think. Very <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it, it's extremely fluid, extremely reactive, but, but policing should be premised upon human rights in the first instance, and they should have a process that they're constantly working through 
because in essence we're getting to the reactive stage you yes. know, who knows the dynamics of a parade um and as much work should be done if possible assuming that this hasn't just flared up yeah um as much should be done in advance as possible to make sure that everyone is clear mm -hmm. as to how the parade is going to go forward mm. it, it, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of our session so i just wanted to finish up with a few more um thoughts about the public spaces in northern ireland because we had a couple of questions that were asked um uh, one was in Northern Ireland, is it the case that many, if not most public spaces are neutral, but spaces of ideology? So the areas themselves have contested meanings, perhaps new spaces could be created that are grounded outside the zero sum game. This would inquire um, investment, creating jobs and equality um, uh, to build such spaces. Um, I th what, what we've been trying to do over this course is to take the problem all right, of, of how identities are expressed in public spaces, um, particularly in divided societies. And the sort of two conclusions, and both of them are mentioned in that, in that comment, two of the ways of transforming the situation seem to us to be um, how you create identities that bring people together, but also spaces where people have rights. And in a way, I feel over the last few years, that's the struggle that we've had in Northern Ireland. No shared spaces, as we sometimes call them, have been created. I mean, the answer to your problem is that we we have a city centre, a very simple answer to this. We have a city centre where if Irish Republicans wanted to have a demonstration in the centre of town, they can legally do so. Up until I think it was 1993, they couldn't. Um, people, so, so, so but it may not always be great, but the centre of Belfast, um, is I think can be demonstrably more demonstrably rather a good word for it actually more shared than it um, than it used to be. So 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 I hope that people get the sense that those that, that there are ways of looking how to transform these problems. No, nothing I hope we I'm sure we've said suggests that it's easy, but that it that it can be that it can be made different. To, to, to very briefly, Dave, to finish up, what, what's your sense of how this sort of spatial identity conflict stuff has been over Northern Ireland over the last 20 years? Are we in a better place than we were? Have we managed to solve some of these problems? Um, we're in a different place. I don't know whether we're in a better place or not. Okay. Um, it, it's hard. When someone asks that question, it's very hard. It's very hard, I guess, to say we're not in a better place place because people the same extent on the streets yeah. and as you've just said people can use the public space um to greater or lesser degree equally but big spaces like the city center being relatively neutral is certainly as you know doesn't there's nowhere near answering the question about the yeah. use of public space because there's probably many more miles of public space that aren't perceived as being mm -hmm. neutral than, than actually are neutral and is neutrality in and of itself the answer to the question um from a human rights perspective arguably yeah. not yeah no i think i think that the use of the not the notion of being neutral i don't i mean quite a lot of people do it people have done it here and i don't okay. think what we want to achieve is neutrality because if, if you're if you're excluding people's identity set aside the issue of civic french republicanism setting that aside and all the all the, all the identity markers that may or may not go with it the policy of france is neutrality mm in the extreme in some instances, mm. to the extent that it interferes with freedom of religion and freedom of expression. You know, is that the answer to mm. a contested society? Let's cleanse the public mm. space of yeah. all vestiges of different identity groups. I think, uh, we're Absolutely gonna, not. Have a look, uh, just before we go, I, I want to, there's a couple of reports you can get on the Northern Ireland Human Rights website, um, uh, which I want to profile. So if you go into the Northern Ireland, or Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, you'll find these are, the, the issue is quite, you can see is directed at Northern Ireland as a problem, but I can tell you if you go to that document on the displays of symbols and the following ones on, um, on parades, you'll find a very clearly laid out argument around the role of rights with these sorts of issues. And anybody interested will find that very, very um, interesting. And I'd just like to say, we're coming right near the end of our session. I'd just like to firstly thank,
James and David for their for their help. I hope this has been a useful discussion for for everybody out there. The, the, there's been some fantastic stuff on the course, and I and I really am delighted the amount of stuff that's that's gone on. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please give us feedback. Let us know if this works. We will be running this course again. Um, and thank you very much for your time and your your your, your involvement.